antibodies matter. How's that for an opening line on a controversial thoughts video? That's not what this controversial thoughts is going to be about totally, but it's a really important concept that I posted about on Instagram recently. As many of you know, the Instagram overlords deleted my account there. So Carnivore MD is currently in detention. We do not know if it will be released out of detention anytime soon, but you can find the new Carnivore MD Instagram at Carnivore MD 2.0. I'm still at Carnivore MD on Twitter. Thanks to Twitter for not banning me and all other social media in the past. But I debated actually going back to Instagram. And I'll say a few words about this before I get into today's controversial thoughts topic, which is how to know if you're metabolically healthy and how to become metabolically healthy. Very germane topics for today's uh, world and current uh, immunologic context. Let's just leave it at that. But back to Instagram. I debated not going back on Instagram because I was so frustrated with this platform. They are clearly censoring people. They are clearly uh, deleting accounts that do not align with their narrative. Having said that, in speaking with many friends, I realized that if I did not go back to Instagram, many people who need to hear the message of metabolic health, of organs, of animal-based diets would not hear this message. I'm thinking about starting other accounts and those other platforms can sometimes become echo chambers. People have already heard the message. They know the message. Well, it's going to benefit them as well, but I think that there's still good to be done on Instagram, despite the fact that I hate the way the platform is run. I hate the values and I hate the fact that they're silencing questioning and they're silencing narratives that don't align with theirs. That is the reason I'm back on Instagram at CarnivoreMD 2.0. I posted a semi-controversial thing today on Instagram, but I'm trying not to get taken down this time, guys. So if you want conversations about things that are controversial, which I will not even name right now, things like this, other things, right? Uh, go to my newsletter. You can go to heartandsoil.co to subscribe to the censorship free newsletter. There's a link above in the bio in my Instagram, or if you're listening to this on our podcast, you can go to the Instagram. There's a link in the bio, but on the heartandsoil.co site, there's a sign up for the newsletter. It's censorship free. And there I can speak freely about issues that I cannot speak freely about on Instagram. Okay. So having said all of that, all antibodies matter <laughs> and shout out to antibodies, all hail antibodies, no matter how you got them, whether through natural immunity or through things like vaccinations, which are great in some ways. Okay. Today's topic of the controversial thoughts video is metabolic health. You guys all know that metabolic health has been on my mind a lot. It's not been in the conversation enough, in my opinion, at all, in my opinion. There are many things that can benefit. One of them is immunity. The strength of your immune system will depend on your metabolic health. I've talked about this in the past with Tommy Wood. We have clearly shown in studies that diabetics, people who are metabolically unwell, have a less robust immune system, a less good memory of things like viruses or bacteria, and a less robust overall immune response to these pathogens, leading to more severe courses of illness. We've seen this with the current pandemic in spades. Those who are obese, those who are most metabolically unwell, metabolically unwell, often suffer the most severe courses of the current virus. That is all well and good. And so often on this Instagram account, often on all of my social media accounts, I've said, be metabolically healthy. You are likely going to be exposed to the virus regardless of your vaccination status. So you should be metabolically healthy, okay? Now, a lot of people ask, what is metabolic health? What does that mean? How do I assess it? And how do I know if I'm metabolically healthy? So that is what this controversial thoughts is about. And I wanna start with one of, I think, the most important papers that I've come across in the last few years, which is this one. The prevalence of optimal metabolic health in American Adults National Health and Examination, National Health and Nutrition Examination, the NHANE Survey 2009-2016. You can read the study, um, but they'll find in conclusions that the prevalence of metabolic health in American adults is alarmingly low, even in normal weight individuals. The large number of people not achieving optimal levels of risk factors, even in low risk groups, has serious implications for public health. This is where the statistic that I often quote that 12% of the population is metabolically healthy comes from. And you'll find that uh, the, the characteristics they looked at, characteristics associated with greater prevalence of metabolic health were female gender, youth, more education, never smoking, practicing, practicing vigorous, metabolic, vigorous physical activity, low body mass index, um, 
less than one third of normal weight adults were metabolically healthy and the prevalence decreased from 8%, decreased to 8% and 0.5% in overweight and obese individuals respectively. Uh, this is a scary paper. You find numbers like 12% of adults actually did not have one of these five indicators of metabolic unhealth. That is an increased waist circumference, elevated fasting glucose above 100 milligrams per deciliter, a hemoglobin A1C above 5.7, a systolic blood pressure greater than 120 millimeters of mercury, or a diastolic blood pressure greater, uh, greater than 80 millimeters of mercury, triglycerides greater than 150, or an HDL that was less than 40 or 50 for men and women respectively, and they were not taking any related medication. The takeaway here is that the majority of Americans are metabolically unwell. So this advice would be very helpful for the American population to hear. Whether they would actually make changes or not remains to be seen. Nevertheless, if we're talking about a group of people who could benefit from an intervention, we are talking about the, the American population at large when 88% of them about are demonstrating at least one indicator of metabolic unhealth. Well, okay, how do we know what metabolic health really is? How do we assess metabolic health? The first thing you can do is look at your waist. If you are obese, that is, if you are overweight or obese, these are two different categories. You heard in that paper that the rates of metabolic health decline massively, massively. If you are overweight, chances are you are metabolically unhealthy. Now, there are two types of being overweight. There is subcutaneous adipose tissue, which is the adipose tissue on your belly that you can pinch. And there's adipose tissue that is inside of your peritoneum in your belly that is called visceral adipose tissue. I've done a previous podcast with Dr. Sean O'Mara talking about visceral adipose, how you can look at it. There's even a device out now that I may uh, look into that you can do in your home to look at your visceral adipose tissue. And that is the worst kind of fat to have. And it's a great indicator of metabolic unhealth. Regardless, being overweight in any way, shape, or form is a problem. Now, even in normal weight individuals or people who are not obese or overweight, there can be indicators of metabolic health or metabolic dysfunction. So I think the best metric here is fasting insulin. And I want to talk a lot about this one in this video. Other metrics are postprandial glucose, fasting glucose, insulin area under the curve. These are a little harder to measure. And then something like a continuous glucose monitor comes into play. I'm going to be releasing another continuous glucose monitor podcast. I do believe continuous glucose monitors from companies like Nutrisense.io are very helpful for assessing your metabolic health because they give you a real-time assessment of your glucose. Fasting, postprandial, which is after meals, you can calculate glucose area under the curve after the meal. You can look at your nighttime glucose. My father, a physician, uh, wore a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor from Nutrisense, and I've worn them. And for my dad, it was great. He really got into it. He looked at his metabolic, uh, he looked at his overall glucose tolerance and it helped him make behavioral changes. But this is not a podcast about CGMs. That one is coming. I've done one in the past. We're doing another two, another one, a part two coming very soon. This is a podcast about the value of a simple, easy metric called fasting insulin. And I think fasting insulin is a, is a measure that should be checked in every doctor's office every time you go to the doctor throughout the year, unless your diet hasn't changed and you know that you are a fit, lean, non-obese, non-overweight individual. If we checked fasting insulin on everyone in the, in the country, I think we could institute or initiate sweeping change in the way that people are healthy and in, unhealthy. So when we're talking about fasting insulin, this is a $30 blood test that you can get at any lab if a physician will write you for it or there are now democratized services that will do fasting insulin for you without a doctor's order, which I think is even better. Um, and how do you know how to interpret this test? Well, if we look at data, we see that the average fasting insulin of the American population is eight to nine micro IU per ml. And to me, that suggests that that is way too high. All right. Now, the confusing thing for people is that the range, the lab range on a fasting insulin goes up to 16 or 20 micro IU per ml saying that that's a healthy range. That's an absurdly worthless range for that test. The healthy range for a fasting insulin, in my opinion, is less than six or even less than five micro IU per ml. And we can derive that from looking at hunter gatherer populations in whom fasting insulin is usually between two and three micro IU per ml, uh, much less, less than five. But going back to the general American population, you can find average levels of fasting insulin in papers like this, though the title of this paper is higher fasting insulin, but lower fasting C peptide levels in African Americans in the US population. They compared this to the general US population, and you can find information in that paper suggesting that the average 
fasting insulin in the United States, at least when this was done, uh, which was in 2002, was eight to nine. So to me, that's too high. You can find papers like this, low serum insulin uh, fasting in traditional Pacific Islanders from Catawba, Stefan Lindeberg, thanks again to him for doing this. You can see that in this study, uh, the fasting insulin levels were two to three, and they did not increase with age as they do in westernized populations. So where does that leave us? I think that in these studies, we can clearly see that if hunter-gatherer populations that are metabolically healthy, not exposed to processed foods, listen to earlier this week, the podcast with Stefan Van Vliet, if you're interested in why processed foods are bad for humans and the importance of a food matrix, but we see fasting insulins that are two to three micro IU per ml in these populations. My fasting insulin is always under three. People I worked with, I always see fasting insulin under three unless they're metabolically unwell. That is really the cutoff. Ideal is less than three, less than five is okay, but this is a test that should be done all of the time. And we should recalibrate the numbers. A fasting insulin above five, really maybe six, but above five is unacceptable for humans and is indicative of a problem. So how do we fix this? If you've heard any of my other podcast, you know that my main concern here is twofold. Seed oils, I think, are the major culprit, and then processed, refined, food matrix stripped away sugar. I do not have a problem with sugar in the context of a food matrix. Again, that's something that Stefan Van Vliet and I talked about this week on the podcast, the Fundamental Health Podcast, which is the broader podcast. You can listen to that. So I do not have a problem with sugar in a food matrix. That does not appear to cause metabolic dysfunction. And I fear that in many ketogenic circles, those two things get conflated, that people in ketogenic circles benefit from the removal of sugar-containing foods, processed sugar-containing foods, and then they conflate any sugar-containing food, be it raw organic honey or fruit, even seasonal fruit or berries or watermelon or peaches or papayas if you're in Costa Rica with the appearance or the exacerbation of metabolic syndrome. And that is incorrect in my opinion. I do not believe that sugar found in a food matrix, which contains more information for the body will lead to metabolic dysfunction, but stripped away sugar that is naked sugar, processed sugar, I think is not a healthy contributor in the human diet. So hopefully we've covered that. Seed oils, you all know, are no, uh, no friend of yours, no friend of mine and are a big problem. So what evidence do we have that this, that removing these things will improve metabolic health? This is a great question, and there are some quite interesting answers to this question. Um, perhaps the, the first one we should look at is a sugar study, um, which has also often been sort of used incorrectly or confused to conflate food matrix containing foods or food matrix sugar with processed sugar. This study will also have important implications for questions around how quickly insulin resistance, metabolic dysfunction can be reversed. Uh, this is the effects of dietary fructose restriction on liver fat, de novo lipogenesis, and insulin kinetics in children with obesity. And what they did was limit processed non-food matrix contained sugar in the study. So do not conflate this with sugar containing foods like fruit and honey. Short term, nine days, isocaloric fructose restriction, meaning they did not do uh, decreased calories in this diet, decreased liver fat, visceral adipose tissue, de novo lipogenesis. Visceral adipose tissue was the adipose tissue I talked about earlier within the peritoneum. Liver fat is a, another marker of metabolic dysfunction. De novo lipogenesis refers to the amount of sugar, specifically fructose, that is converted into fat in the liver, and it improved insulin kinetics in children with obesity. Okay, these findings support efforts to reduce sugar consumption. Could not agree more. That happened in nine days nine days, which leads me to ask a question. Why are these things condoned? Why are they subsidized? Why are they cheap? Why do food lobbies get a place in Congress? And why are we allowing our population to even buy these foods? Perhaps this gets into deeper philosophical conversations, but if we are in the midst of a pandemic that is killing people with metabolic unhealth, and we are considering intense measures as we are now, why are we not thinking about how to limit the consumption of sugar? Should we tax these foods? Should we not tax these foods? It's just a question that I'm asking, but nobody's even said that sugary processed foods are contributing to worse outcomes with this virus. And there's an easy way to get rid of them, tax them, lotteries. I'm still waiting for the million dollar weight loss lottery, the million dollar medical metabolic health improvement lottery, 
and the door-to-door -door FEMA agents asking if you have any questions about why you are not metabolically healthy or how to improve it. So what other studies do we have looking at improvements in metabolic dysfunction? Well, there are unfortunately not any studies with an animal-based diet yet, but there will be in the future. We are building an animal-based diet research foundation nonprofit, which will fund this type of research. But there are some great studies with paleolithic diets, which are similar uh, to animal-based diets in many ways, though not completely equivalent. Uh, we could consider a couple like this one specifically. Perhaps this one is the best one to begin with. And as you will see from this study, the um, metabolic and physiologic improvements come from consuming a paleolithic hunter-gatherer type diet. This is done by Linda Forsetto in 2015. Fasting insulin uh, and glucose were measured. This is in picomoles per liter. I'll show you the conversion in a moment. On the usual diet, the fasting insulin was 69. Uh, plus or minus 63, 69 picomoles, picomoles per liter. Fasting insulin is 20, is, excuse me, nine, uh, a fasting insulin of nine micro IU per ml. Uh, and on the paleolithic diet, the fasting insulin went down to 21 um, with a standard deviation of seven. 21 picomole per liter is three micro IU per ml. So we're back to that kind of magical number, three micro IU per ml, I think is a great place to see your fasting insulin. If you're curious about how I did the conversion of those units, you can just look up any sort of insulin unit conversion and see that 21 picomole per liter is 3.024 micro IU per ml. And you can convert the other metrics in that study if you wanna see that 69 uh, picomole, picomole per liter is, is nine uh, micro IU per ml. But this also speaks to the point that nine micro IU per ml is again, about the average for the American population. And I feel that's inappropriate. Yet probably 98%, 99% of physicians would look at that and say, it's within the reference range. It's fine. We're not going to worry about it. But as that study showed, um, using a paleolithic type lifestyle could improve that. All right. I believe an animal-based diet would do that in the same way. If you exclude seed oils and refined sugars, I think that is the most effective intervention that these studies are using. This is another great study, marked improvement in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism in diabetic Australian Aborigines after temporary reversion to a traditional lifestyle. The study essentially shows the same thing. This one, they, they ate a, a reversion, uh, they had a reversion to traditional lifestyle and they did eat a hypocaloric diet, very low caloric diet. So it's hard to know if it was the actual foods they were eating, which looked pretty animal-based. Uh, beef, kangaroo, turtle, bream, yams, honey, fish, birds, kangaroo, crocodile, Kangaroo, freshwater fish, yams, honey, figs, birds, turtles, yabbies. Yabbies, I think, are like crawfish. Um, these, that's a pretty animal-based diet. It's like meat and honey and meat and fruit and a few tubers. This is about as close as we're going to get to an animal-based diet. They had massive improvements in their metabolic health, although they also did have lower calories. It's hard to know what their baseline calories were. Um, this goes back to one thing I talked about with T Tucker Goodrich, that in many of the studies done with Paleolithic and these Aboriginal type reversion diets, they have to work very hard to eat isocaloric diets because they're so satiating, probably because the products of linoleic acid, specifically the cannabinoids are not being produced 2-AG in an anamide, leading to problems with satiety. Uh, please refer to previous controversial thoughts and the podcast with Tucker if you'd like to see that. Um, a couple more studies and then we'll wrap this one up. So we have this study, um, metabolic and physiologic effects from consuming a hunter-gatherer paleolithic type uh, diet in type 2 diabetes. Even short-term consumption of a paleolithic type diet improved glucose control lipid profiles in people with type 2 diabetes compared with conventional diet containing moderate salt intake, low fat dairy, whole grains, and legumes. That is a conventional diet containing those things. So the paleolithic diet was again beneficial. You can read that study if you'd like more details. And finally, um, favorable effects of consuming a paleolithic type diet on characteristics of the metabolic syndrome, a randomized controlled pilot study. Uh, we conclude that consuming a paleolithic type diet for two weeks improved several cardiovascular risk, factor, risk factors compared to a healthy reference diet, quote unquote, healthy reference diet in subjects with metabolic syndrome. So again, these are published studies that have been done with a paleolithic diet, which is quite similar to an animal-based diet. If anyone is not familiar, an animal-based diet is meat, organs, fruit, and honey. Um, but all of these paleolithic diets had lots of carbohydrates from fruit, um, from tubers, things like this, and from vegetables. Many of you will know I'm not a huge fan of vegetables. You can refer back to previous podcasts if you have questions about that. Not a huge fan of vegetables. I think that leafy greens are no friend of yours. That's why I'm wearing the kale is bullshit shirt for this controversial thoughts. So in summary, 
What is metabolic health? Metabolic health is a lean physique. You should be able to see your abs or close to it. You would want to make sure you don't have a lot of visceral adipose tissue through a variety of ways. You can get a DEXA scan or an MRI to look at that. And you'd want to check your fasting insulin and your fasting glucose. Maybe your postprandial glucose with something like a continuous glucose monitor. But fasting insulin is the thing I talked about most in this podcast. Fasting insulin levels are average around eight to nine in the general American population, which is much too high in my opinion. The reference range is at 16 plus, which is an absurdity, uh, a travesty. <laughs> and if there's any reference range in modern medicine that needs to change, it's that one. Fasting insulin should be less than five or six. I prefer it even less than three micro IU per ml. I showed you guys why. Evidence from the Katavans, evidence from paleolithic diet intervention studies, evidence for, from Australian aboriginals who went back to their traditional diet, all of these see metabolic health improvements. You can also see improvements in metabolic health and insulin area under the curve, which is another measure of metabolic health when you remove processed sugars that are stripped from the food matrix. So that is the answer, guys. If you want to be metabolically healthy, remove seed oils, remove sugars stripped from the food matrix. Do not fear fruit. Do not fear raw organic honey. Uh, do not fear animal foods. Do not fear fat, saturated fat. In fact, those are the most nutrient rich foods on the planet. You must get organs in your diet as well, or I believe that that's going to level up your diet in a massive, massive way. And that is why I built Heart and Soil. As I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, you can go to heartandsoil.co um, where you can find the censorship-free newsletter. While you're there, you can also get some of our grass-fed, grass-finished, desiccated organs, which are from New Zealand. And I'll read you guys a review from one of our customers. There are so many amazing stories that we hear from people who benefit from getting organs in their life. And desiccation preserves the most nutrients possible. And for a lot of people, it's way easier than eating fresh organs. This review is from Roger H. It's for bone marrow and liver from Heart and Soil. It works. It just works. Eating an animal-based diet and adding Heart and Soil supplements, I feel great. I can't explain it, but if I decide to go a few days without it, I notice it. I always take my bone marrow and liver in the morning, but if I ever get tired in the late afternoon, I take a few more and my energy returns. Working as a nurse, uh, I miss a lot of meals. This has allowed me to continue on with stamina. Coworkers notice my sustained energy, very impressed with the power of organs. Thank you, Roger. I'm very impressed with the power of organs too. Hopefully this video on metabolic health has been helpful for you guys and helped you understand how to assess it and how to correct it. Let me know if you have more questions. Stay radical.